supposed to put together, I was supposed to put together some kind of an introduction. And instead, we ended up talking about Peter going with his grandfather, buying artichokes in uh, Castroville, and Michael and uh, Kabari wine, and his. What else do we get into? It's all these strange kind of. Craig Hodges chasing uh, Eugene Cup around the office when they worked with Works uh, with a broom. But um, I can tell you that uh, that Peter went to school at Yale. He practiced, or I guess he worked with Giancarlo in Italy um, after leaving school. Went to work with Craig Hodgetts and Eugene Cupper under the, the name of Works, and has since practiced um, on his own and has taught at USC um, practicing architecture. I'd like to present Peter DeBeffo. You can put the first slide right on. There's always that long, painful period uh, in architecture lectures when you wonder when the hell he's going to get to the first slide. So I have a first slide uh, to keep everybody happy until I get to the real first slide. And uh, so that's just for you to look at until I get, get rolling here. Uh, the lecture. Uh, if it can be called that, is in three parts. Um, the first part is a sort of general introduction. Uh, I just bought that slide tray. It should work. <laughs> well, I'll go ahead. And uh, when I need the slides, I'll see how we're doing. Um, I wanted to say something about um, John Dreyfus um, article, because if you take what he said at face value, uh, and I don't know, I have absolutely no idea where I'm going, uh, then if the lecture is confusing, you'll understand why. Uh, hopefully, it, you won't have to use that as a crutch to explain what happens. OK, the um, first part has to do uh, with what I uh, intend to be uh, largely a kind of quick flash and a kind of inspirational series of statements about architecture. Uh, the second part has to do with what I think uh, is, uh, or, or what is of unique interest to me and a great many uh, other architects uh, who I spend a lot of time talking to about architecture, um, issues having to do with, with space and, and kind of new definitions of architecture, again, having to do with some principles and some observations. And then the third part has to do uh, with work. Uh, the lecture is very much, uh, or, or is partially biased towards uh, those first two parts, largely because the last year has, uh, uh, much of my time has been tied up uh, with things like the Coastal Commission and, and, and uh, stuff like that, and uh, all the things that nobody ever tells you about in school. Is that actually not working, or, or the trade? No. I already dropped 100 slides this morning on the floor and put them back together. What, what's happened to it? Are you really saying that the tray fell apart? What? <laughs> the slides are OK. Are, are, are the... Uh, Negotiators making any predictions about when it'll uh, be, be back together? Three minutes? Well, I'd better wait because I do need the slides.
relative to architecture, but really quite a different kind of discipline. Um, I hope I avoid being pedantic, but I will, in fact, try to cover what I believe are really essential uh, issues of architecture, uh, and uh, also then try and relate those ideas to my own work in ways which are probably not as, as, uh, as exact as one can perhaps state them. First of all, uh, however, I want to talk about what I believe are the really unique and extraordinary uh, 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 opportunities and conditions which describe and proscribe architecture. One of them is clearly its dimension. Uh, and by that, I don't mean necessarily that it's terribly large, but it is never really very small. It's always large enough to encompass and to surround, uh, whether, it's at the, whether it's at the scale of a, of a kind of village or whether, in fact, now there's where I, I'll, I'll catch up now, or, or whether that dimension is a very extraordinary one uh, uh, you know, which is really beyond kind of immediate perception. It is always, it always has that quality uh, of, of making an entire environment and prescribing a kind of total experience merely because of how large uh, it is and because of what its program is. Furthermore, it is not observed. It is experienced directly, oh boy. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to stop because this is really terribly out of order now. I, well, let me see where we are because I can't, I can't I really, all right, maybe it's just those first few then. All right. I'm going to be a little hesitant because I have to skip back and forth here a little bit. Uh, the other point here is uh, that Oh, I'm really out of, very radically out of order. Well, maybe it would be better just to skip some things. The slides are nice anyway. I mean, I can't keep my thoughts if I have to keep remembering which slide I'm on. All right, let's, let's start from here, see what happens. I'm sorry, my whole train has really been destroyed. Um, I'm going to skip the introduction. I can't do it. This is, I will tell you what, I'll, I'll footnote it. I, I'll try and just catch up with myself. Uh, oh boy, I, I, I must apologize. I'm, I'm really uh, totally, totally uh, distracted. I'll have to just uh, give you a picture show here and get up to something I can deal with again. Uh, the, the subjects were having to do with uh, the experience of architecture as a direct and immediate thing. In other words, something not red, uh, not vicarious, but encompassing and totally involving. And the point of the Burkert's building there was that uh, it was not to make an argument that architecture was entirely self-referential but rather that it had the capacity to recreate uh, a whole experience and, and to reenact a whole experience. And in that sense, it, 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 it did not have, does not have to be read. You do not have to have a textbook or a set of instructions or footnotes to experience architecture. That's a very abbreviated form. Uh, this has something to do with uh, uh, architecture as it is experienced and seen and uh, um, a, a, a replay of Le Corbusier's statement about architecture being the play of forms under light, the play of forms correct, wise, and magnificent, which I think still applies. 
Okay, now I'm going to get back on track again here. This is part two. There has been, I think, um, a very healthy and very ruthless kind of critique of modernism, uh, which has become very strong just in the last, I think, four or five years. Uh, and I would like to um, talk a little bit about uh, a particular aspect of modernism, uh, beginning with some of the earliest definitions of what the elements of the new revolutionary architecture uh, were to be, and also uh, picking from the kind of, kind of scraps, the edges of the diagrams, the pieces that were being rejected at the time as against those which were being promoted, and see, see what there was in the, the ancient architecture uh, which was discarded uh, largely because of its technology. But with it also went certain conceptions uh, of wall and the function of wall and, and uh, most clearly conceptions of space and conceptions of order, which were in fact not perhaps generated out of that kind of architecture, that technology of thick wall and buildings which were largely based on mass and on compressive structures of one sort or another, domes and vaults and things like that, uh, but which were not necessarily uh, uh, only possible to make in that way. In other words, the technology could have changed. The technology could change uh, to uh, a, 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 a thin wall and, and, and post and slab or post and beam system without necessarily throwing out uh, all of those spatial types and all of those ordering principles which had dominated architecture until that time. The uh, modernist uh, uh, fixation and the modernist conception of space was of something entirely fluid, entirely open, and continuous. There was also that bias, that, that, that somewhat inexplicable bias, uh, absolutely against uh, symmetry, all sorts of sociological, uh, uh, cultural arguments were made uh, 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 for the fact that buildings could not be symmetrical, but they were, I must say, never terribly clear to me, uh, and I think uh, uh, very dubious. The logic behind them was very dubious. That architecture, uh, the, the modern architecture, uh, again, with, uh, in some diagrams of Le Corbusier's on the left there, uh, promoted the idea of, a, uh, of the thin wall and the strip window on the left there, and, and uh, 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 differentiated that by sketching on the right the thick-walled architecture, which was restricted in the uh, uh, dimension of the opening and the type of the opening, because that wall also had a technical function, that function of holding up the building, whereas the new architecture no longer was restricted by that necessity. In other words, the wall was only governed by the amount of light which you wish to introduce uh, to, into the space uh, behind it. That kind of architecture, uh, uh, s sooner or later, was bound to come to, the, to a point where the wall was no longer really uh, a wall at all in the traditional sense. It was a frame, a minimal frame. The wall has been reduced, finally, the opaque wall to the frame, uh, and, and it is almost entirely glass. And in this case, uh, 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 it's a very elegant and very beautiful uh, 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 response because here Le Corbusier is already uh, dealing with a number of surfaces, a number of ways of manipulating r light through that surface. But it's very thin and it's very minimal. It's maybe four inches, where it whereas it might have been two, three, or four feet in the past to hold up such a structure. And in that depth, he has to include operable windows, fixed translucent glass, and adjustable louvers, louvers which adjust up and down and in angle. So all of the functions that that thick-walled architecture uh, uh, encompassed in that depth, that, that function of filtering and controlling light as it enters space, uh, it, it has now been reduced down to that very minimal dimension. Uh, and all sorts of, of tech, uh, uh, um, instruments, the louvers, the sliding, the, the tracks, the metal tracks which the louvers slide in and so forth are introduced uh, in order to uh, do what the, the uh, uh, older thick-walled architecture was capable of doing merely because, or in large part, only because of its depth. 
that modernist uh, 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 interest and, and, and devotion to continuity and extension and references beyond each point in the building. In other words, when you were in one space, you were always overlapping and extended into another. Uh, it, it, with, with Leonidov's project here, it's one of the most sort of elegant monumental examples of that, where the building seems to just, just go on beyond even the horizon. And on the left there, uh, 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 a Japanese project, a recent project, where, where the building becomes so pervasive and the idea of continuity so pervasive that the whole u world gets gridded off. And, and again, in, you know, uh, Super Studio made images that were, that were similar to that, that absolute uh, continuity. The other aspect of, of, of that early architecture uh, had to do uh, then with how to respond to the light, how to control the light, given that one did not have that depth, that surface ac across which the light could travel and be modified and controlled as it entered a building. On the left, Le Corbusier developed the, the Brise Soleil, which was a way of sort of making thin walls perpendicular to the surface of the building, which in effect create a kind of depth uh, over which the light passes, uh, which, the, which the light has to strike first before entering the building. And in that way, both the quality of light and, and the, the heat gain on the building uh, is controlled. Khan in the Luanda Embassy on the right, uh, uh, instead of um, adding a, um, that, that grid, that sort of cage in front of the building, actually separates the two functions which the wall now has. If you think of the, the Le Corbusier movable louver, here he's taken that, that opaque wall and removed it from the face of the building, from the weatherproof enclosure, as it were. And these walls are now freestanding walls, and the glass wall is behind that. And again, it's behind it by a dimension which is not unlike the thickness of lo typical load-bearing wall kinds of architecture. In other words, it's about a three or four foot separation. And the light, therefore, must travel through a very particular set of openings in that outer wall before it enters uh, the space, again, for reasons of, of light and, 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 and temperature control. The other aspect of that architecture, which is the one that, that, that more noticeably disappeared because there was no absolute necessity to deal with it. In other words, the sunlight and the quality of light was always a subject of architecture. And even as that wall thinned out, it was necessary to develop some technique for dealing with that problem that was still there. The other thing that really vanished, I think, uh, with that technology or with that, the condemnation of that as, a, as, a, as not a, an expressive or, or a responsive tool for making architecture, was uh, the spatial conception that went along with that. And that spatial conception had a number uh, of very distinct characteristics. And uh, I think I'm going back far enough here uh, uh, by beginning with the Romans, Domitian's palace on the left, and Hadrian's villa, or, or a fragment of Hadrian's villa on the right, where what you see uh, are spaces which are, uh, whether it's a single space or, or a set of spaces on, on this side or in Domitian's palace where there's a whole collection, what you see is a whole series of spaces that are self-referential. In other words, each space is a discrete, whole, complete object in itself. Uh, it completes itself independent of, of, of um, the spaces adjacent to it. The, the connection between those space, spaces is that. It's a connection. It's not an overlap. So there is enormous discontinuity, and there is a kind of establishment of a whole series of spatial cells as a kind of collection, which are then linked back together by a variety of devices. In most cases, a thick wall, <coughs> excuse me, a thick wall uh, or a colonnade, which is a, co a, a, a colonnade perpendicular to you as you enter that space, uh, uh, such as here, a, a circular one, so that that acts as a kind of screen which reintroduces the next space or the next series um, of spaces. I think there are, uh, on the left, uh, that, uh, that conception of a deep or a thick wall or a layered wall, a wall which is actually in many parts, which is what Kahn takes from the Romans as well, uh, is explored in very elaborate ways to manipulate light down through a complex section, a deep building of some kind or another. The, the plan on the left 
is of, of um, uh, Nero's Palazzo d'Oro, and it uh, uh, is made up of two distinct parts, that central space, which has an oculus above it, and then those perimeter sort of cells. And on the line between the two, on the line of the uh, uh, hexagon, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a skylight which lights those spaces. And so one looks from a light space into an intermediate kind of space through what one anticipates to be a wall into a deeper space, perhaps a darker space, but actually there's more light on it. So there is more light in, at the exact point where one anticipates there being less light, there's more light. And if, if you can see this, that's exactly the theme of, a, of, of, of Roman painting of that period uh, where one looks through frames and through walls and through columns uh, into the light into the light which is hitting other elements beyond those walls uh, more strongly than the wall which is closest. And that fascination with light and the disintegration of wall, the wall was very much a part of that architecture. Um, the slide on the left is, is, is again meant to emphasize the idea of, of, of a series of spaces, a collection of spaces. I'm not sure it makes the point very clearly. At least one understands that central space as a kind of fixity. Uh, on the right um, is uh, 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 Palladio's Villa Rotunda. And what struck me about it, although it makes some of the same points again, was the, 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 the power of that cross-axial arrangement, which itself actually suggests a kind of thrusting out into the landscape, which, uh, given what I said before, one might not have anticipated. And that happens also in, in, on the larger, at a larger scale in Hadrian's Villa where those elements do, in fact, extend and do sometimes uh, uh, explode out into the landscape in ways which are quite extraordinary, all the more extraordinary because of the nature of spaces as, as contained and fixed spaces. Khan, uh, here in, in, in um, a project that, that predates the Luanda Embassy, uh, is again working with uh, the problem of the wall and the control of light over, over that depth, or actually he's really working against the thin wall and trying to manipulate the light over a deeper surface. And what he did, does, basically, is he, he folds the wall. In other words, he doesn't make a, 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 a kind of false work, but rather he folds the wall and, and sets the window on the back edge of that deep wall in order to control, and, and again, and, and manipulate the light uh, into that space. And that strategy really is not a new one. I mean, uh, it, it's really an ancient one. On the left, uh, uh, the Basilica of Constantine, that's really just the, 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 the side aisle. That's the, the um, uh, one third of it. The main span and the main vault of the building uh, uh, spring from those uh, fragments of, of structure that stick up at the highest level. So what you're looking at is a great sort of scoop, a kind of hollowed out deep, deep wall that, that by this time is about 30 feet deep uh, in, in, in that, that is the niche, the giant niche is, is at least 30 feet deep. And that whole thing is scooping in light and filtering it across those surfaces. And here again, Palladio is really, uh, uh, you know, a colonnade, an, ar an arcade uh, is really just that. It's, it's, a, it's a wall that's gotten so deep that you can walk between it and the building. I just lost the sound. Uh, did I do that? Oh, there it is. Um, this is then uh, uh, the Luanda Embassy in a little more detail, showing that screen wall outside of the glass wall. Uh, and on the left, uh, uh, that wall occurs at this edge and on the upper edge uh, of, of the long wing on the right. And then again, Khan uh, at Salk Institute uh, is, is uh, in the part that was not built, the kind of community center, as it were, where he wraps um, every building almost in another layer. And here you can see quite clearly the, the, uh, the square, which is the building as such, and, and, and the drum, the cylinder, uh, which is that screen wall. And they're, and they're shown as entirely separate at that point. OK. Uh, now I'm going to show some work, and, and uh, uh, it begins uh, with a project that is, that is very definitely uh, a modernist in its, uh, 
begin starting points and uh, and uh, I think makes its main reference to uh, if we can call it that traditional modernism. It's a building for or it's actually two buildings, uh, two families, uh, two single family dwellings uh, in Laurel Canyon. Uh, some of the shots uh, are construction shots. They're kind of mixed in at first here. Uh, it's a steep uphill site. One house is for myself and another for friends. Uh, the project began uh, as a much more complex situation of a number of families trying to get together and, and, and create a, um, uh, a more shared kind of complex uh, situation. Um, unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, it was not possible really to do that, many of them financial. But it did at, at least uh, come down to uh, the two of us uh, uh, struggling through and somehow surviving both our friendship and the uh, project survived the ordeals um, and, and got built. Uh, the, um, I'll go through this actually in, in um, three parts. The first part is the conception of the building uh, and how it was resolved. The second part is a kind of very quick uh, uh, construction record which shows uh, how the thing came together and the intention there, if I had managed my introduction, my previous introduction more effectively, was to uh, uh, address some principles which I think uh, are continuing principles uh, that are not obliterated by the addition of certain spatial types, uh, certain formal conceptions, uh, and, 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 and ideas and attitudes about walls and light, but are simply added to it. So I feel very strongly that uh, this work, for me at least, is still very relevant to what uh, I feel are some new concerns on my part, uh, and I think it, it, it is a, th these buildings are quite articulate about what those issues are. And, and hopefully I'll, I'll relate that to you. The uh, main sort of organizational space having to do with the, uh, the kind of public zones of the building, let me go back once, uh, starts with the street, which is this edge. It faces an uphill site. And the idea was that the street and the exterior of the building, for the most part, were general in nature, uh, presenting a kind of consistent public face uh, to the street and to the outside. Uh, they also, uh, in doing that, uh, they also share a structural system, and they share, they have a common set of materials uh, and colors which are uniform. Uh, on the entire uh, outside wall of the building. The entry zone is between the two buildings here. Uh, you enter up between and you come back and you enter at the yellow door, which you can see there. The other entry is opposite that. That, uh, the right one is not working. Okay. Uh, that entry is seen here, uh, and it becomes the kind of single axial organizing device of those two buildings on the site perpendicular to the street. And that's treated as a very formal uh, and, and, and very kind of public space. One can, however, continue on up uh, onto the hill uh, and, and enter into that, sur that, that, that courtyard zone uh, on, on the backside of the building facing up the hill. The uh, section on the left shows the common elements of the building, uh, which, which are the continuous skylight uh, along the street edge, which is the, the, the bubble on the right-hand half of the section, the three-story frame on the street and the two-story frame uh, above the whole basement. Um, uh, the, the basement is concrete. There's a, the, the, the steel beam at the main floor level is the uh, only other framing element enclosed in, 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 in the basement. And that same set of elements, uh, I think, can be seen fairly clearly here. Uh, it also includes the balcony to the west and the balcony inside. Um, and that, those elements make up the generalized structure of the building. The idea then was to be able to uh, move into that shell, into that generalized volume and structure, and, de and respond uh, idiosyncratically and exactly 
uh, to the other requirements uh, uh, that, that, that each family had in a very particular and non, what, non-modular, non-repetitive uh, way, but in a unique um, and, and very momentary way. And I think that's probably very hard to see th th in, in these slides, but this house has then a, a, a kind of core, a kind of other building within the building that separates it into two spaces, a studio space here and a living space there. And I think the other section shows, and you can see it in the plan, I hope, um, shows the two-story space in the center and the children's rooms over the dining and kitchen there and the parents' room over the, a, a kind of small sitting alcove on the other side. Uh, those elements are seen very much as, as things which are fitted into that other frame. And, and an effort is made to articulate those elements as separate and as distinct. They are carried on the main structure of the building. In other words, they are not built literally within it. They, they are carried on the repetitive regular structure, but take very uh, special and, and, and unique forms uh, within that frame. And that shows then the, the kind of idea of the superimposition of that general frame, that gridded wall of glass or, or, or corrugated, whatever it is, and then that element uh, within the space, uh, 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 which is particular to the requirements of that family. And that, that, that's then merely a, a, uh, uh, the, the, the two things seen as a shell on the right and as the shell over those interior volumes on the left. Uh, the other um, aspect of it has to do with the structure. Um, you should all read Philip Johnson's Seven Crutches and, and make sure that, uh, you, you know, that uh, you know how to lay that on me. Uh, the subject of the building is not only its structure. However, the structure is meant to be um, uh, articulate, uh, visible, uh, real, uh, and perhaps poetic if it finally works. Uh, it is entirely visible within the uh, main spaces of the building, and all of the elements, all the pieces that it are made up of are, are shown and are highly, very much a part of the quality of surface within the space. Uh, the, the basic element on the left there was really a, an early study which showed those two balconies and the basic trussing system of the roof. Um, and uh, on the right is a model which shows uh, that developed a little further with a particular kind of structural system um, by then, which had been adapted. The one other element which uh, you can see at the top of this slide and in the upper part of the, the model, uh, which was an extraordinary piece, was that trussing horizontally to tie back uh, the, the roof uh, diaphragm to uh, the, the cross bracing on that edge. And that will become a little clearer in some of the construction shots. And this I'll try and move through fairly quickly just so that one can see, hopefully, the extent to which in this building, the process of building and the technique of building uh, has a great deal to do with the quality of the building and the nature of surfaces and, 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 and so forth in the finished building. Uh, these frames were erected in, in those cross bayed sections on that, on that foundation uh, as single pieces and then the other uh, uh, separate columns uh, were, uh, were, were brought in one at a time. And by this time, and the slide on the left is obviously in the wrong, uh, there you can see the elements of that structural model, which is that, that horizontal truss under the skylight, and then the main carrying members of the roof. And you can also see uh, on the left slide, particularly the, the extra beams, the beams that are introduced at that intermediate level to carry uh, the upper level uh, bedrooms uh, within the two-story space. Uh, this then shows on the left the roof on and, and, and on the right, I think we're out of sequence, I get back there, yeah. That, that shows then a whole series of connections uh, and transitions and uh, a, a roof uh, uh, to that edge condition, the wall is not yet on, and also the beginning of the dingbat stuff inside, which is the, the stud um, and, and jip board, I'm sorry to say, construction inside. And uh, a little flash ahead on the right showing how those volumes are finished off and on the left uh, how they were built very much within that space and the emphasis was very much put on the fact that they were uh, a whole kind of complete volumes 
within the main space of the building. In addition, the, there was a kind of uh, low-tech prefab uh, panel made up in the basement and then hoisted up into position, which, also, which besides going up fairly quickly, had the great advantage of allowing us to uh, 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 suddenly, as the window in the middle of the lower building there uh, was being closed up to say, hey, let's put a window in there, and we unbolted a few panels and had some extra plywood laying around and, and got a whole other window very simply out of that. Uh, this is then the street wall, and it's made up of two materials, uh, the, uh, the corrugated metal and the corrugated fiberglass, which gets light into that lower level uh, in a very diffused way uh, as needed. And um, then if I'm in order here, I have a feeling I'm a little bit out of order. Um, these are the, the, the south wall on the left and the north wall on the right, uh, m made distinct by their sun shading or lack of it. Um, and that's then the windows, which are all organized on a four by four grid. And then within that storefront grid, our whole series of um, uh, uh, are inserted the operable windows, which are another system uh, on their own. Uh, this then is the, the entry sequence, the, the two openings at the street. And you can see the uh, entrance to the other house there. And then as you go up, you approach it on the left. That's the entry kind of, the, 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 by this time on the right, you've turned back towards the street again. And you're actually looking out across the street. Uh, and then you enter to the left or right. Uh, and then if you are standing at one of the doors and you look up, that's what you see. That's that, that skylight with all its uh, overlap of trusses and parts. And already, even, even in a point like this, you begin to see all of the elements of the building, which are the frames, the, the walls, the, the, the window frame infill, and, and, and the actual structural framing of the building itself. And there's meant, it's meant to be uh, a, a celebration of all those elements, of all those parts. Uh, it's not meant to be uh, a or the definition of architecture. It's meant to be an exploration of a particular attitude towards architecture, which is um, uh, happens to exploit, and in this case, a method of construction uh, which is, by definition, highly articulate. Um, I'll show you a, another building which takes a very different position later. But this one, the emphasis is very much on the parts and on the complexity of parts. And then I have uh, 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 a few slides, again, somewhat out of order, um, which have to do with living in it, with being there, uh, with moving through it, and all of the kinds of variations which occur uh, uh, to deal with, with uh, light and sun and changing seasons and so forth, which is what the yellow uh, awning is all about. Uh, and uh, now I'm turning around a little bit here out of water. Um, this has to do with that wall, that glass wall to the west, which is about the most sort of devastating thing you could do, is turn a building to the west and open it up like this. We have a, a very steep mountain which, which protects us from uh, that really low western sun. And then uh, at certain times of year, we add the, the yellow canvas and add more white canvas. And hopefully in another 10 years, there will be enough trees around to serve that purpose in, in the, in, in, even in the summer. That's another view of the, the two houses uh, from up on the hillside a bit. Uh, now, this introduces um, more particularly the business of the distinction between those two houses. Um, in other words, uh, uh, how distinct and how uh, expressive can the two houses be given their, their kind of generalized shared parts? Uh, uh, you know, how, how do you finally make that distinction, that absolute detailed distinction? Well, that came very much to a head as we discussed uh, how to paint it, how to finish it. And uh, at that point, uh, I was really uh, uh, put in, 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 in the position which I felt was a, a kind of challenge to do what I'd been saying I would do, uh, which was to, uh, at the other extreme, at the, at the other end of generalization, um, uh, uh, to really allow uh, the thing to go in whatever direction was, was clearly uh, desired by the people who were, after all, going to live there. And not to try and govern, therefore, 
th that, that final, that last millimeter or whatever, which was the paint. And so we talked a great deal about, about colors and, and the kinds of colors that, that they liked. And uh, most of them were in, in, had to do with, um, or I related them to, uh, a southwestern kind of Pueblo and Mission colors that range from pinky beiges to sort of pure tan. And uh, Roger and Diane also liked the, the, the terracotta primer color of the steel, which we modified very slightly. So this building finally then became, uh, is dominated in its, in its detail and in its chroma uh, by uh, those colors and those things which were um, a source of fascination uh, for them. Um, the thing that, uh, the, the quandary that occurred for me, the thing that, that I really had to think about a great deal in doing this was the fact that by this time, I was very much convinced that the structure uh, was fully played out and ever present. In other words, there was no danger of not being articulate about that, about the structure and about the process. And I was getting more and more interested in, in painting it out because it seemed to me that, that um, uh, 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 it was no, not necessary to call any further attention to it. And my impulse was to reduce the distinction of frame and plane and wall and to focus on the space. So what you'll get to see is that idea played out as well as this one, which calls attention to and makes a very hard edge relationship between uh, structure uh, and volume and enclosure. So that here, the, the volume is painted out a, a very slight off-white, that is the volume of the, uh, 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 the big volume of the building. The interior volumes of the building are painted either, either uh, 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 that peachy tan or, or beige, or beige. And if you can't tell which is which in any one of the slides, it's probably because that's exactly what happens in the building. During the day, one moment you think one is one and one is the other, and they reflect back and forth off of one another uh, until finally you think maybe there, there are a half a dozen colors. And the fireplace there on the left, just to prove how flexible the whole thing is, uh, was put in just about a year ago, much after it was all built. And uh, this is then the looking back towards the entry on the left, and this is the southern balcony, uh, not at just, oh, it looks like this, the sunscreens were not on. That's why there's all that sunlight on the wall. Okay, this is the other house uh, where the idea of submerging the frame uh, into the wall and reducing the kind of dominance of that frame uh, became the intention. And the elements that sat within it were the focus of the paint. In other words, it was, the paint was used to identify uh, other whole parts and in a sense to, to permeate the space with color and light and not to identify so much uh, uh, those systems and those, uh, and particularly the structural system. The colors on the left and the right in this case are fairly accurate. The, the walls of, the, uh, uh, of that inner volume are a very pale green and actually if you can see that switch plate, you can see that that's white and that's green. And maybe there are other places that you can see uh, on the left there. The alcove that the light is entering into on the upper level is white and the walls just in front of it are green. And one of the uh, really startling things to me when, when the building was uh, first enclosed was the, the, the quality of light in it. Because what happens is these are morning shots where the, where the light is coming almost straight down through the skylight. And so you're getting warm sun from the eastern side, with that warm direct light from the eastern side, and diffused light from the west. And that whole uh, uh, sequence is, of course, reversed in the afternoon. And uh, uh, so on the right is, the, is a morning condition again still on, on the left is, is an early afternoon shot where the light is really coming from the other direction. So here the, the shell, uh, the frame, the perimeter of the building is painted out white uh, and, and uh, the, uh, the, the green wall, the wall of those interior volumes uh, and the elements of that volume, the stair, the lavender and the beam which runs through it. Uh, are, are the things which, which get identified in a particular way. Some of these shots are also just to, to, to hopefully show uh, uh, a range of aspects of the building. It's very hard to photograph some of the smaller uh, 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 kind of private spaces of the building uh, because they are so small. It's also about light and about the play of light on walls and, and across surfaces um, and the whole kind of 
uh, 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 delicate quality of things that occurs as light is fragmented and broken up through, through that decking or whatever other elements intervene. It's also about life and parties and playing around and turning the whole thing into a kind of jungle gym. And in this case, a, uh, a, a spider web hunt where you get a prize at the end of your string all over the house. And uh, that's supposed to tell you all that we're going to the next building now. That uh, gives you, I think, a fairly clear idea of uh, this is the same building repeated twice. Um, the the, the two-story spaces on either side and that volume that runs through the middle, the diagram sort of comes alive again in that, in that night shot. OK, this is a building by uh, Victor Gruen Associates, uh, which uh, uh, we were asked to, uh, to remake in some way uh, with a very minimal budget. And uh, uh, this was the uh, Old World Savings uh, Bank. It's on a very distinct corner uh, on Reseda uh, and, and Northridge. Uh, there's a shopping center on one corner, uh, a gas station on another, and a savings and loan on the other. Uh, and nobody walks. And uh, you probably would get arrested if you went through the intersection at slower than 35. So it's a very peculiar place. And this building didn't help things much. And uh, so basically, we had to take uh, the interior space more than anything and try and reorganize that. And we had a very minimal budget uh, for the exterior. I'll show you some rather fuzzy uh, early model photographs of the scheme, which I argued uh, satisfied all of their aspirations. And they argued and won that, it's, it, that, that it didn't satisfy their budget. So uh, scheme one uh, had to be rejected for that reason. Um, and uh, uh, so, but I'll show it to you very briefly because it, it makes the point of the of even scheme two. Mainly, the reductions were in the exterior uh, elements. We weren't really able to do any of this in the first scheme. We added this kind of shed in under this monumental overhang. Uh, we shaded that south-facing glass wall. They wanted a great deal of glass there. Uh, the main idea that remained was that big volume put within. Uh, the two-story volume of the existing building, uh, the big yellow submarine, as it were. This is the transformation having been stripped even further uh, 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 after our working drawings were completed. They eliminated even more of it. So it has this funny, unfinished quality to it. Um, and uh, the most I can say about it is that everybody in, in, in that area hates pale green, <laughs> even more so now. Uh, but it's a shame in a way that it didn't get played out because it is very incomplete on the outside. The inside, however, was finished more or less as design. Uh, that big volume you can see in the ungridded area on the left, uh, all of the, the, the openings in the wall and the perimeter of the building uh, had to remain where they were. So that sort of struggle and that manipulation to get this big volume in there with, with you know, twice as many tellers as before, the vault is in the middle the old vaults in the middle, the new vaults on the left, that's more or less what at the top. And that's more or less what was happening. They wanted twice as much uh, 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 service in the same space. Uh, so it, it, it pushed out into this two-story volume uh, uh, and, and uh, 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 you know, divided that space into those two very distinct parts. We had proposed to move the, the uh, uh, other bank operations, which were in the wing that disappears off the top of the left slide in this upper volume. But uh, for a variety of reasons, they didn't want to do that. So we ended up running ducts through it. And instead, it was quite useful that way. The uh, uh, elements of the, of the building were really then that perimeter wall, which uh, was uh, to be maintained as a kind of white, kind of neutral shell. It was pretty neutral to start with, uh, worse than neutral, perhaps. Uh, and then the, the two horizontal planes, the big problem being the acoustical problem, they preferred a hard, the hard surface, so we had to do it in the ceiling. And we got around the cottage cheese syndrome by, by uh, uh, finding this, this uh, uh, machine room stuff that's a perforated corrugated, which has uh, sound absorbing material above it and was very efficient because it spans seven feet. 
and then and then we made the one foot bands in it which carry all the lighting uh, and 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 uh, supply and return grills and it turned out that that cost about the same as the as the usual cottage cheese ceiling uh, and really turn out I think a lot better than that the uh, the yellow wall is all uh, um, studs and stucco sort of cheap construction uh oh there we go uh, I wonder why something else is out of sequence here let me try something no something's missing over there all right, the two, those two special conditions in the building occur at either end. This is one end. The, the, each of them has two elements. One is that that volume has to tuck back to meet the door, and the other is some special use. This is the regional manager's office, uh, wh which really had to be within that volume, but also needed some light, so that sort of compromise of the translucent block wall into that room solved that problem. And then if we're back in here, well, you see, that's what you were supposed to see first. That, that was the drawing of that condition uh, so that you could see perhaps the, the uh, relationship between a drawing and a, and, and, and a built condition. Uh, yeah, I'm really all topsy-turvy here. Okay, this is the other end, uh, which uh, is, is, is talking back to meet that door. And then behind that curve and that curve, seen with the glass roof there in the middle of that drawing, are the two safe deposit booths uh, where you go in, uh, in, in in absolute privacy and under the, the gentle blue-gray glow of northern light, you look at your jewels or whatever, or filthy pictures or whatever you keep in, in vaults. We had an, uh, played out some of the sort of ecclesiastical aspects of it a little further uh, in the form of, of circular sort of halo-like fluorescence above the tellers, but... Uh, <laughs> Somebody caught on to that, and they changed it. <laughs> That's a kind of peek into that corner again, where the low ceiling area is, where the safe deposit uh, booth is. And this is the uh, um, transformation. This is where the globe was, right? Right there. And now you meet there at the center of the, of the uh, phantom globe. OK, there's another tray with a limited number of slides on it. That building, I guess, could be characterized as an effort to take a very limited program uh, uh, in terms of intentions and a very limited opportunity in terms of money, and somehow, uh, and, and therefore, you know, mater the materials of it, the, the, the parts of which it are made, are minimally expressive. They're all the kind of no details materials, uh, no, no articulate structure, uh, nothing like. Uh, in the in the steel frame house, so instead you have to. We worked there with uh, the, the exclusively with the idiosyncrasies of that particular situation and the expression of those idiosyncrasies and changes in use or intention or whatever uh, uh, in the form of the the special volumes of the building intruding into that uh, generalized space. The next project is a. Uh, uh, and, and, the, and the last built one, and then I'll show you one other uh, project that's uh, underway, or not underway, it, it stopped before it got underway. Um, uh, this project uh, is a building which was initially conceived of as being built in, in, in the sort of basic LA dingbat materials, studs and stucco, um, and wa was an effort to somehow command and control those materials based on some of the same principles uh, of, of the two steel frame houses, and I'll go into that in some detail as I go through. This is just a very quick panorama. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's great to show this on the East Coast because this is where the kind of site that they think everybody here lives on. And uh, this is the absolute top of the mountain above Sunset Strip, and this is just turning from left to right. I think you all recognize it. That's Palos Verdes there. Sometimes you can see Catalina. And that's turning then towards Century City, uh, Santa Monica, and the Pacific. Nice little site, eh? And that's then the Santa Monica Mountains with the sun glowing off the Pacific. It had uh, on the site uh, the wall, this wall, which uh, w 
describe the edge of the driveway up to it and two schemes were developed very briefly one of which ran parallel to that in other words we stretched the house out along that wall and the other the one that was developed was one which took the opposite tack and and ran perpendicular and in which we tried to leave or create as much uh, uh, extra outdoor space on the main level as we could this earlier this model which is not the model of the final scheme uh, uh, did not show um, a wall an additional retaining wall which was put outside of the pad this this is the line of that kind of boomerang shape of the pad we eventually put a wall no not there here to actually do this that model was not truthful actually um, and but the basic idea of the building was established by this model which was the 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 entrance off the street the car would enter directly into the garage there and a kind of open connection to the entry point and then the building itself is organized uh, in three zones um, the kind of more cellular closed spaces to the rear uh, uh, guest rooms kitchens and a kind of sitting area uh, in that bay then a big interruption of a two and a half story high space which is missing its shed at this point in the middle and then all those spaces that were open to the rest of the house uh, so that in this zone that's really one space all the way through there's a bedroom a dressing room and all that but it is acoustically at least open all the way through whereas all of these spaces in the rear especially the guest rooms are entirely uh, uh, acoustically and for the most part visually separated uh, from the rest of the house the strategy remained more or less the same uh, the uh, dimensions changed slightly and the geometry became slightly more complex and I show you just because uh, the clouds are so great I can't resist showing more a couple more of these slides uh, there's the the finished house uh, that's the uh, uh, site plan of the final scheme uh, which uh, uh, shows you that curve at the top which was the existing wall which is up at that level the new retaining I'm sure you can't see that I'll do that <laughs> later <laughs> that's really all about clouds and towers uh, <clears throat> this then shows that that upper retaining wall the new lower wall and the house kind of straddling that um, the the one other uh, 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 sort of uh, manipulation that occurred in there was to pull the bedrooms out beyond the body of the other sort of third of the building uh, and to orient them that way to take more advantage of the view and also not to have this problem which you can see could occur here and as you come up the other way which is of people looking straight in that room it also had the advantage of um, being able to be screened more easily uh, and to work into uh, some of the logic of the building. Uh, it faces more or less uh, due south and has big overhangs at all levels. Or it has louvers, uh, four by four louvers, on those south facing uh, <clears throat> windows or openings that don't have uh, a, a, a big overhang um, above them. I'm going to go. Uh oh, I'll go back. Oh dear, this is not my night. Can you unstick that one? I'll talk about this one for a moment. The, the, this is the a, a kind of splayed up plan. Uh, that one's jamming. Uh, which shows. The, the deck at the lower level, uh, which is a tile deck, the perforated metal deck at the, at the bedroom level, and a perforated overhang at that upper level. And the panels you see there are solar collectors, which uh, the, the house is heated, uh, uh, gets all of its hot water and heating uh, from that active collector system, uh, and has a few other backups, but it's, it's about 95% off of that. That the plan on the left shows that entry bridge, the two guest rooms and, uh, in the upper part. That split down the middle that the stairs within is, the, is, is, a, is a two and a half story space with the collectors on top of it. Uh, I have to go. That's the, this is then on the left is the upper level, the level that's at the level of the street. And, and this just jumps back then to the lower level. Uh, one of the, the things that develops also in this building is that having established that regular structural grid, uh, the volumes kind of played through it, uh, burst out beyond it at times, and then finally 
uh, it also evolves in terms of density of sort of planes from many walls to uh, at the rear half or at that northern edge to almost all glass at this edge with the exception of that wall. And finally, in that corner, there's a two-story post all by itself. So in that corner towards the view, towards Arco Towers and all that, uh, the whole thing finally breaks away and opens up. And, and, and it's exactly in that corner uh, where there is the most glass uh, that there is also uh, the fireplace to kind of supplement that uh, 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 heating system. That is not advancing. There we go. The building also has uh, a very distinct north and south face. Uh, the, the north is to the left, and what one really sees is, is basically a wall and not so much of that clear story glass on the left. And on the right, it's this, this deep layered kind of thing with all these balconies and that bathroom. And then uh, that louvered face is the only thing that comes out to the face of that balcony. The east and west elevations, uh, the left is, is the uh, east. There it is. Nope. Try one more. No, that's not it either. I guess we lost that somehow. Let's go ahead. Oh. Well, we're out of sequence again. The east and west elevations are very similar in the sense that they are, are based on that, that same section with this, the, the two-story space riding out the top and those closed spaces here in the, in the living dining room uh, and, and all that along that. Front. Oh, there it is. Look at that. It turned up on the right. <laughs> That's it. That's the other elevation. Boy, this is really, uh, we're really funny again here. And that one's not advancing now. <laughs> well, I'll make sense out of it somewhere or another. There, uh, the building also, as it moves from that north edge, where it's mostly wall and enclosed spaces, to that southern edge where it's really open and then turns sort of horizontal out onto those balconies, the structure also changes to a more articulate structure where, that, where, where the framing, the main framing, I should say, uh, is revealed. And the floor is seen as something that, that, that rides across that framing. And that framing is also continued out on out under the balcony uh, uh, and, and becomes a kind of dominant part of the building <clears throat> at that edge. Who did that? I, I'm, I'm, oh boy. No, it, it's all right. It, Okay, that's the section uh, which shows at the upper level is the street level and, and then that stair uh, 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 that comes down in, in under that high space uh, into the living room and the balcony with the single handrail across the top on the upper left uh, is, the, is the main bedroom uh, balcony. Uh, oh. Th this, this then shows you all of the levels of the building and in under here uh, uh, is the uh, uh, is where all of the, uh, how do we lose that other one? Anyway, under there and under there is where all of the, the, the hot water storage is from the solar collectors. Uh, and this shear wall uh, also arrives at the ground at that point. And that, that's really all that lowest level uh, is there for. And you can get just a peak of the collectors there. All of the stairs are, that you see uh, are, are required uh, for one reason or another, mostly by the city. This is access to the collector area, to the storage area. The other stair that you see uh, hung off the end up to um, that end. entry point. Uh, uh, Again, why don't you just, if you can, just advance that when you see this one go. Um, working our way around to that front edge of the building, uh, this is going to be a swimming pool here that's not in yet. Uh, you can, uh oh, now we lost the right. <laughs> okay, that's a view then of, of that. Of the, no, do, Okay. If we try, we may get, no, we need the next one over there. 
Okay, now you're moving around. This is approaching it from the, the normal kind of street way up. And, and the gate you can see just the corner of in the, in the middle left there. The stair that you see there is a way of going down outside and going directly into the kitchen at the lower level. That's here, otherwise one can walk straight in. And, and, and the building, if I wasn't so distracted, I would have remembered my point, which is that as you approach the building, you, you do see this whole site. You see the view to the west and to the south mainly, and you come in behind this wall, and it's completely shut off again for a moment, and then you come back through, and then from this point on, the views are sort of reconstructed. You see fragments of them here, and, and as you enter the building, you see another fragment to the southwest. Uh, this is that stair, the, the shortcut down into the, into the um, kitchen through that court. Uh, this is what you see. You're now on that, at the entryway on a kind of bridge that connects the, the entry area here to the bedrooms, and you see then that view to the south, and you, I mean, I'm sorry, to the east, uh, towards the city, and it's not until you get, oops, and then if you, however, instead of going down, if you continue on out from the bedroom, uh, this is the balcony off the bedroom, and this, this marvelous stair um, is an alternative way for, for people who don't su suffer from fear of heights uh, <laughs> to get down. Um, some people think they would rather burn than, than risk a heart attack on that stair. That's the stair as it comes down onto the main deck. You'll notice that we, we, we sort of we eased off here a bit and made a nice solid traditional uh, tile surface here. Could you advance the one on the left? Uh, and uh, that's then uh, the, the, the same deck looking a little closer at that end. This is that stair as it sort of hangs over that edge. And on, that's, that's where you arrive inside coming down on the left there. The main bedroom is up on the right over there. This is the level you're now on in that photograph on the left. If you, in the, the room that it was taken from has this door out onto the, the, the grade at, at, at that point, and we're looking from that room out towards the view uh, to the south. This, needless to say, is the fireplace that, that sort of warms that two-story glass corner. OK. Can you advance the left? That's a different building. But you, hard to tell, eh? OK, this is now finally uh, the other end of things, the, the, um, a very incomplete project, a project which was terminated just as it was getting off the ground. Uh, but it is the sole example that I can give you at this time of uh, really uh, uh, quite a different exploration. Um, it was a uh, remodeling. The existing building is shown more or less accurately in the yellow uh, poche, which is over the kind of pale green. Can you see that in the back? Yes and no. Well, the most distinct elements here, I hope you can see a little bit, uh, is what the existing building is. Basically, it's a kind of oversized kind of tract house. Uh, it had one redeeming characteristic, uh, which was a kind of clear, uh, a, a linear uh, a break in it running horizontally here in the middle of that drawing, which corresponded to a change in level. That circulation zone, which was more or less open to that main living room space in the middle, then continued on down to other bedrooms at the far end. The spaces that were attached to this and, and, and uh, included in this were, were very undistinguished, and, and many of the connections, mainly the one in, in the middle of the, of the two pieces that are the piece that's rotated off to the right here. You can see there's the sort of dumbest possible connection between those two elements of just those two geometries kind of colliding in this odd angle. And those kinds of junctures and those kinds of meetings uh, were characteristic of the whole building, perhaps not quite so, so visible as there. But it was full of these kind of awkward and, and rather clumsy uh, uh, junctures. So two things we tried to do. One was to take this spine, as it were, and make it articulate, to make it really manifest, to make it uh, uh, you know, one of the organizing uh, elements of the building. The other w was then to take these spaces and give them some, some character, some distinct quality. And given that it was all this kind of studs and plaster building, 
um, and, and that that logic was, had to more or less be continued, the strategy was to, to, to wrap those spaces, as it were, in some way uh, that made them particular and unique and more exact uh, in their own qualities. I guess the, the, the third thing was also to kind of make a whole series of new junctures, kind of, uh, and, and they ended up being sort of almost like, you know, elbow joints, you know, points like this, uh, the point at the top there, and, 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 and many others having to do with entry uh, and, and, and movement out onto the deck to the west. Um, there were two other linear elements. One was a kind of uh, uh, half-baked kind of strange uh, uh, fragment of a trellis, which was right here, uh, which, which we continued all, all the way along the face of the building to form a kind of entry gate there uh, and to, to uh, carry some small decks off of those uh, two rooms. Uh, to the, to the uh, west, which is up in this case, there was a big patio and a pool and a magnificent view, a sort of 30-mile view of the Mount Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, and of course, uh, again, the problem was how do you open up straight into the west, and in this case, an even more severe situation because there was no cutoff of the sun, and he didn't even want to put trees out there. I had thought maybe we could put a few trees and screen it. Instead, we added a whole layer outside of the building, which, which is a semicircle here and then comes across the middle and another semicircle. And that was really a, a two-layered thing. The glass walls are held back from that. The glass walls themselves had, 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 had curtains which were uh, supposed to be motorized. And then the, the outer ring also had a series of, of shutters on rollers which could be moved in, uh, in and out of position so that you could screen it uh, from either of those planes. Uh, this is the uh, only other thing I can show you is the model which shows uh, that slice uh, through the building, the two planes, the one with the semicircles on it there. And, and again, there you can see some of the, um, uh, those additional elements. The, the, the main things, I suppose, are that, that uh, area around. I'm going to go back here for a moment. No, 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 no keep that. No, all right, just leave that. Wherever it was, just, that's fine. <laughs> I don't mean to be nervous. Um, this, this is the entry point, which, which was one of the main uh, uh, kind of problem areas of somehow how to enter a building in this way, turning that corner into that point uh, through that space. Uh, then there were a whole series of, of sort of uh, a Roman bath type spaces, uh, uh, exercise rooms, saunas, and, and showers. And you know every room had to have its own sink. And, and, and so on and so forth. And, and that bath at the top left there uh, was a kind of um, uh, multi-purpose bath. If you filled it part way, it was just a bath. If you fill it further, all the way up to the outer limits of those, uh, uh, its shape, then it was a, a, a deep pool and a jacuzzi. Uh, the added, the, 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 the main bedroom gets extended out into that semicircle. The dining room is here. And that other cir sem a circle, full circle, is, is a breakfast room. Uh, this is the kitchen here. Uh, he laughs. He's jealous. <laughs> OK, we can go ahead on the left now. This is for one person. Uh, this is then th that entry. Uh, it had this funny thing. It had this sloped roof in the middle also. Uh, which which uh, had no effect spatially inside whatsoever. In, in other words, it was uh, not uh, the, the ceiling inside was flat. Uh, we kind of tried to to pick that up in some way that was a little more honest. In other words, we, we put it up there as a piece of false work, as a kind of sign, uh, and didn't try and make a space out of it because it would have seemed really inappropriate to do that. But we pulled the face of the building forward in order to announce that that kind of entry at that point. Uh, this is then a kind of low view looking up into that new entry with the, the bulge of the dining room coming out into it, uh, and then the extension of those bedrooms out onto those uh, uh, balconies at that side. And I think you can see fairly, clearly enough on the left that, that uh, a series of planes that are established by all of those elements. This then is the western face where this wall slices through. This wall 
here and in the middle is, is outside of the glazed and enclosed wall of the building. In other words, the glass line is back here. This is a screen wall with all sorts of things that could be dropped down to, <coughs> excuse me, to shade it. Again, here, this is the line of the glass. This is, this is a screen wall. It's all very diagrammatic as you kind of, I, I, you know, get your nose down and look into it. These are very kind of preliminary ideas uh, uh, about how to add this, this zone uh, on the building. And that then is the, is the, the view, uh, the down low uh, view to the west there. I think that building, uh, although it is really only a fragment and a very kind of preliminary scheme, uh, uh, indicates fairly clearly uh, another set of attitudes and ideas about spaces, which is what I tried to articulate before. The intention is not to replace uh, other principles, but to expand them and add to them. I don't really see myself uh, this as a contradiction or as a radical change. It may look somewhat more different than it really is, if only because it is so schematic and it is based also on a particularly inarticulate uh, uh, constructive method. On the other hand, it attempts to be very articula articulate about the elements of the building and to really celebrate the problems of the building, the orientation of the building, uh, and all of the, the intentions, whether they're symbolic or, or, or literal intentions, of the building. The attempt is made to bring them forward, to make them a part of the real uh, and direct experience of the building. And if there's any sort of summary uh, um, that I could give of that and the other work, uh, it's something to the effect that I, that, that, that I believe architecture really has to be characterized by uh, intentions which are really uniquely a part of the conception of the whole building and are communicated through that architecture, uh, through the architecture itself. In other words, the architecture is uh, encompassing directly experienced and real in itself, sufficiently real on its own, that it is a, a, a reenactment of all aspects of life, and its vitality is that. Thank you. Tom asked me to ask if there are any questions. How do you get a good slide projector, eh? Uh, I'd like to apologize for being so hesitant myself. I, I, I uh, hope that next time I do this that uh, I can be uh, less traumatized by non-functioning technology. Thank you.